This system of equations, essential for electrodynamics and known as Maxwell's equations, is in my opinion the most beautiful system of equations in all of physics. And it is of course not about some special beauty of the symbols used to write this system. I mean, the elegance with which these equations were obtained, essentially just by translating into mathematical language the properties of nature already known to us from experiments and observations, and also how this mathematical form turned out to be far more meaningful than a simple verbal description of observed phenomena. Let us imagine that we, like Maxwell, live at the end of the 19th century, and we decide to bring together all that we know about electromagnetic interaction. In fact, it is not that much. All the most important things can be described in just a few very simple statements. Well, first of all, we know that some objects possess a special property called electric charge, and that such objects either attract each other if they have opposite charge signs, or repel each other if they are charged the same way. From experiment, we also know that this force is proportional to the product of the charges of the interacting bodies, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That is, the observable characteristic of the electric interaction between charged bodies is the force of their interaction. However, it is not always convenient to use this characteristic, at least because the force describes both interacting bodies together and not each one individually. That is why physicists decided it would be more convenient to describe the electric properties of a body by using a slightly different quantity, the electric field intensity. It is equal to the force that would act on another charged body placed near our body, divided by the charge of that body. Physicists also say that the intensity is the force acting on a test charge. The electric intensity that appears near a charged body depends on the distance from the body, or in other words, on the point in space at which we define it. This means the quantity is distributed in space in a certain way, and a distribution in space of any quantity is called a field of that quantity. In our case, a field of electric intensity, or as is commonly said in physics, the electric field intensity. Moreover, the electric field and electric charge are linked by a direct cause and effect relationship. Fields appear near charges, weaken with distance from them, and far from charged bodies tend towards zero. From this, we can make our first conclusion about electromagnetic interaction. A body that possesses electric charge becomes a source of an electric field, which determines the interaction of this body with other charged bodies. Since the electric field intensity is a vector quantity, the electric field itself is also a vector field. And between the source of a vector field and the field itself, there is a specific mathematical relationship. The divergence of this field is proportional to the density of its sources. In our case, the divergence of the electric intensity is proportional to the charge density. Let me explain what I mean with the simplest example, a flow of liquid where the role of the vector field is played by the flow velocity. Let us say we have a pipe with some kind of liquid for the liquid in the pipe to flow somewhere, we need a certain flow to enter one end of the pipe and exit through the other. The velocity of the liquid flow through the pipe will be directly related to the volume of liquid that flows through the pipe per unit of time. If we supply more liquid into the pipe, the speed must increase. If we supply less, the speed must decrease. That is, between the flow and the velocity, or in other words, between the cause of the liquid's velocity and the velocity itself, there must be a direct causal link, which means there must exist a certain mathematical operation that connects these two quantities. In mathematics, this operation is called divergence. Here's how it works. Imagine that somewhere in the pipe, a leak appears through which a certain flow of liquid, delta Q, escapes. It is clear that on the section after the leak, the flow will be equal to Q minus delta Q. Therefore, the velocity of the liquid flow will be determined by the following formula. Let us suppose we cannot examine the pipe and determine where the leak is located. But inside the pipe, we have sensors that measure the flow speed of the liquid. 
Can we use their readings to determine where exactly the leak is and how much liquid we are losing because of it? Of course we can. If two neighboring sensors show the same speed, then there is definitely no leak between them. But where the leak is located, the sensor readings will be different. The first one will show us V1, defined by the following formula, and the second, V2. The difference in speed, that is delta V, will equal the power of the leak divided by the cross-sectional area of the pipe. Now, let us divide both sides of the equation by the distance between the sensors, which we denote as delta x. Now we let the distance between the sensors approach zero, transitioning from deltas to derivatives. Then on the left side, we obtain the derivative of velocity with respect to the length of the pipe, and on the right, the leakage flow density. Wherever the velocity remains unchanged, that is, the derivative is equal to zero, there is no leakage. But at the point where the pipe is leaking, we get a jump in velocity, a non-zero derivative, and a non-zero ratio of leakage to volume. Let us call that the leakage density. Obviously, the same will be observed in the case where liquid is not leaking out of the pipe, but on the contrary, an additional volume of liquid flows into it. Our formula will still work, but the sign of the derivative will be positive instead of negative. In fact, this is the very thing we call the divergence of the liquid's velocity. More precisely, this is how it looks in the simplest one-dimensional case. In three-dimensional space, the divergence is written in the following way, where Vx, Vy, and Vz are the components of the flow velocity along the corresponding coordinate axes in the Cartesian coordinate system. But what do all these liquids and pipes have to do with electromagnetism, you may ask? The answer is simple. The flow of liquid is described by a vector field of flow velocity. Electric interaction is described by a vector field of electric intensity. That is, the nature of the phenomena is different, but the mathematical objects that describe them are the same. And that means the same mathematical rules that apply to the vector field of fluid flow velocity must also apply to the vector field of electric intensity. Therefore, the divergence of this field must also be proportional to the density of the field's sources. With the only difference being that in this case, the source is the electric charge density. That is, the statement that the cause of electric interaction is the presence in bodies of a characteristic known as electric charge automatically allows us to write the following equation. What else do we know about electromagnetic interaction? For example, we know that the motion of electric charges produces a magnetic field. This is also a vector field, but its shape differs from the shape of the electric field. Instead of emerging from point sources or converging into sinks, the magnetic field has a vortex-like form. That is, it circulates around whatever causes it, in our case, around a current-carrying conductor. In mathematical language, these observational facts about the properties of the magnetic field are translated as follows. First, the divergence of such a vortex field is equal to zero, which automatically means that the density of magnetic charge is always zero, or in other words, that magnetic charges do not exist. This statement is called the second of Maxwell's equations. Next, the link between a vortex field and its source in vector field theory is given by another operator, the curl. For those especially curious, in Cartesian coordinates, it is written like this. But what matters more for us now is that, with its help, the fact that a magnetic field is generated by electric current can be expressed in this form, where J stands for the current density. In this way, we get another of Maxwell's equations, known by a separate name, Ampere's Law. In addition, we know that a changing magnetic field produces a vortex electric field. This is Faraday's law of induction. So by analogy with how we linked cause and effect in the case of electric current and magnetic field, we can write that the curl of the electric field is proportional to the change of the magnetic field. Or more precisely, in accordance with Lenz's rule, which is also an experimental fact, it is proportional with a minus sign. And the last thing we know about electromagnetism is that a changing electric field also produces a vortex magnetic field. That is, the magnetic field can have two sources, electric current and a changing electric field. Accordingly, we must supplement Ampere's law with a correction, known as Maxwell's correction, which accounts for the changing electric field. 
Thus, we obtain these four expressions corresponding to the statements we have listed. One, the source of the electric field is electric charge. Two, magnetic charges do not exist. Three, the source of the magnetic field is electric current or a changing electric field. Four, a changing magnetic field generates a vortex electric field. More precisely, Maxwell's equations are usually numbered in the following way. Faraday's law is called the third Maxwell equation, and Ampere's law with Maxwell's correction is the fourth. In practice, this order does not change anything at all. Strictly speaking, these are not yet Maxwell's equations, because they contain proportionality signs instead of equality signs. The exact form of the equalities depends on the choice of unit system, that is, in what units we measure current, charge, electric field intensity, magnetic induction, and so on. For example, in the SI system, Maxwell's equations are written in this way. Here, epsilon zero and mu zero are fundamental physical constants known as the electric constant and magnetic constant, previously called the vacuum permittivity and permeability, which we can, for instance, determine through experiment. Now let us pause and reflect on what we have just done. We simply took the familiar rule of thumb properties of electromagnetic interaction, translated these properties into the language of mathematics, and obtained a system of equations, a ready-made tool allowing us to quantitatively determine the parameters of electric and magnetic fields for any distribution of currents and charges. In other words, a universal means for solving all problems of classical electrodynamics. And that alone is already impressive. But that is not all. It turns out that our system of equations contains far more information than we originally put into it, and that by analyzing it, we can reach conclusions that would otherwise be extremely difficult to obtain. For example, what would the electromagnetic field look like in a situation where there are no currents and no charges? Let us first analyze this situation from the perspective of the verbal laws we formulated. No electric current, which means no magnetic field. No charges, which means no electric field. And we quite logically conclude that if there are neither charges nor currents, then there can be no fields at all. Now let us ask the same question of Maxwell's equations. Taking into account the conditions of our problem, they will be written in the following form. And of course, if electric and magnetic fields are both zero, these equations will be satisfied. But it turns out that in addition to this zero, or as mathematicians say, trivial solution, this system of equations also has another solution, like this. These formulas are well known to physicists. They are the so-called wave equations, describing, as you may guess, waves, that is, periodic disturbances in field values that travel through space. In our case, these are disturbances in the electric and magnetic fields. The solutions to these equations will be what are known as traveling wave equations, electric and magnetic, and they will travel together in phase with the directions of the field intensities. More precisely, the electric field intensity and magnetic induction being perpendicular to each other and to the direction of propagation. It is also very interesting to take note of this quantity here in the wave equation. In any wave equation, the quantity standing in front of the second time derivative is equal to one divided by the square of the speed of wave propagation. And if we measure the electric constant and the magnetic constant, it turns out that this speed will be exactly equal to one divided by the square of the speed of light. From this, we arrive at the conclusion what we obtained are nothing other than the equations of light wave propagation. Or if you prefer, in reverse, a light wave is nothing but a wave, that is, a coordinated disturbance of electric and magnetic fields propagating through space. Let me emphasize, we originally said that we are analyzing a purely vacuum situation, meaning that in the region we are studying, there is nothing. And yet, it turns out that in this emptiness, electromagnetic waves can indeed exist and propagate. And although scientists already knew before that light is some kind of wave, only through Maxwell's equations was it finally understood what kind of wave it is, and that these waves do not need a medium to propagate. This became the first serious blow to the concept of the luminiferous ether. And since we now know that this quantity in the fourth of Maxwell's equations is nothing other than the speed of light, we can rewrite that equation taking this fact into account. 
In doing so, we see that electromagnetic fields turn out to be dependent on this very speed of light. But back in school, we are taught that speed is a relative quantity dependent on the chosen frame of reference. And this, in turn, means that, according to Maxwell's equations, observable electromagnetic phenomena must also depend on the reference frame. Simply put, the electric and magnetic constants should not be constants at all. They are linked to the speed of light, and if this speed were relative, then in different frames of reference, those constants would change, which would lead to changes in how electromagnetic phenomena occur. But that should not be the case. Ever since the time of Galileo, physicists have known that the laws of nature should not depend on the choice of an inertial frame of reference, that is, a frame moving uniformly relative to the observer. Thus, the concept began to enter physics that the speed of light in a vacuum must be a constant value, independent of the chosen frame of reference. And from here, it is only one step away from the creation of the special theory of relativity. That is how much new knowledge, not just about electromagnetism, but about physics in general, we were able to uncover just by formulating as mathematical equations the properties of electromagnetic interaction that we already knew from experience. The equations we obtained as a result of this translation turned out to be not only more precise, rigorous, and applicable in practice for solving problems and performing calculations. It turned out that by writing our knowledge in the language of mathematics, we were able to learn more than we could have otherwise. That is exactly why physicists like to say that equations are smarter than we are, meaning that when we express facts in mathematical language, we often obtain something much more meaningful than what is possible with ordinary, everyday words. As Galileo himself once said, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and when it comes to discussing nature, it is best to use that very language. Unfortunately, just like any language, the language of mathematics must be learned, and the mathematical language of modern physics can sometimes be quite complex and intricate. Fortunately, for those who are not fluent in mathematics but still want to learn more about physics, there are science communication channels on YouTube, like this channel, and if you like what I am doing here, I kindly ask you to support the development of this project by becoming a sponsor, right here on YouTube or on Patreon and Boosty. A link to the latter, as well as a corresponding QR code, should now be appearing on your screen. Many thanks to everyone already supporting the project and to those who choose to join the sponsors today. That is all from me. All the best to you, dear friends, and see you again soon in our next videos.